Study Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this IPT online lecture on Unpacking Inclusion in Peace Processes and Resistance to It with Dr. Esra Juhada. It's been a real pleasure to prepare this conversation with you, Esra, and I'm really happy you can join us today. Before we dive into it, I do want to say a few things, especially for those of you who are joining us for the first time. My name is Julia Scharinger. I'm a program manager here at the ASPR and I'm accompanying you throughout this lecture and overall series. Before we get started, I also want to take a few minutes uh, to acknowledge that we all come from different places, lived experiences, questions and expectations to this lecture. So feel invited to join us in a spirit of curiosity, of generosity and the assumption as well as commitment of good intent. This really is a place where we invite all of us to show up as our kindest, most courageous and robust selves to conversations that may require care and gentleness, just as much as rigor and reflexivity. And I'm sure those conversations are close to the hearts of many of us. And now let me introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Esther Chuhada. She's an associate professor of political science at Birkent University in Turkey, a senior expert on dialogue processes at USIP, and a senior fellow at the Inclusive Peace and Transition Initiative in Geneva. With inclusion becoming not only a buzzword, but also a bit of a contested word, I find Esra's work very helpful in offering an in-depth and multifaceted understanding of both inclusion and exclusion. Again, I recommend to read her USIP report on understanding resistance to inclusive peace processes. And working a lot with our approach of interactive conflict transformation here at the ASPR, Esther's understanding of inclusion as a fundamental human need particularly resonates and intrigues me. And I hope you find it intriguing too. I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about your thoughts and insights, Esra, and I'll see all of you again after about 45 minutes for the Q&A. Enjoy. Thank you for this lovely introduction and uh, thank you all for joining, uh, joining me this afternoon or morning, wherever you are joining from. And it's, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be with you and to give this um, talk this afternoon. Okay, so um, what I will be uh, sharing with you today is uh, the results, the findings of a research project that lasted about two years uh, when I was a senior fellow at the US Institute of Peace uh, two years ago. Uh, but actually, it also goes back um, uh, a while. Uh, so uh, to uh, this data set uh, that uh, Tanya Puffinals and, and I uh, gathered uh, between 2013 and 2015 uh, at Inclusive Peace, which later became Inclusive Peace, um, looking into different, uh, look, looking into the modalities of inclusion. So this was uh, Tanya's uh, idea. Uh, she had uh, seven, eight different modalities of inclusion, and we had this uh, massive uh, research project looking into 40 peace uh, negotiations from around the world to understand how these modalities were used uh, in the negotiation processes, in the peace processes. So after we completed that project, uh, something that actually, um, that really was striking for me in that research project was that it was the extent of resistance to inclusion. And it, and it was the case in almost, uh, uh, in almost all cases that we looked, uh, majority of them had some instance of uh, resistance. So uh, what I wanted to do then was to dig a little bit deeper into this question. So why, uh, why is resistance so widespread? Uh, who is resisting? How are they resisting? And against whose participation we see resistance? So uh, that turned into a, a separate research project. And recently, uh, I think um, Hadil also shared you the link uh, in the chat box for the report, but the report of the, uh, the research report uh, got published in March uh, 2020. Here is the address uh, for it. You can actually access to it from the USIP uh, webpage. Uh, 
Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about, again, the rationale for doing this research. And as, as you all know, um, everybody is talking about inclusive peace processes these days. And inclusion has become such a buzzword in all uh, peacemaking, peace building circles. Uh, there is a, a, a huge uh, sort of push uh, for inclusive processes. Uh, it's on the top of the policy agenda uh, of the UN, of the World Bank, a lot of different regional organizations, so on and so forth. But with, uh, with this, um, this the, the implementation of this inclusion agenda has not been really smooth. And we also see a lot of empirical evidence of backlash and, and, and resistance to this agenda. So this, uh, this presentation and this research specifically looks into that, as I said, uh, to understand the dynamics a little bit better, who is resisting, how and why. And as I said, uh, most of the data uh, relies on the inclusive peace uh, case studies, but some additional case studies that I also did. And on top of these case studies, I have also conducted uh, about uh, 15 interviews with women negotiators uh, to uh, specifically, specifically focusing on resistance to women inclusion as well. So there's also a lot of material in the data from these interviews with women. Let me first um, uh, talk about how I define uh, resistance in this, uh, in this research. So I define resistance to inclusion as the behavior of uh, particular uh, persons or groups that undermine the successful design and or implementation of an inclusive peace or political transition process. And uh, in this research, the unit of analysis was the behavior, the behavior of uh, resistance. And I, uh, I identified the different instances or events of resistance across these 43 cases, uh, which added up to 85 uh, instances, 85 events. And then I coded these events. I coded each event based on uh, who is resisting, uh, against whom, uh, how, what was the motivation, etc. Uh, so the, the findings that you will see today uh, are a result of that. Uh, and as I said, it is either individual or, or group, group behavior. Something that I realized as I was doing this research is, and maybe this is also because my background is more in political psychology, the, the key thing in inclusion exclusion is, is about who is in the in-group, the Venus, right, the, the, uh, the sense of belonging to a group, and who's in the out-group, uh, otherness, what we call as otherness. So this is, uh, I, I, and I thought it is impossible to think about resistance to inclusion uh, without keeping this uh, key psychological uh, process of categorization in mind. So a lot of my understanding, my, my trying to understand this resistance behavior goes uh, back to social psychological dynamics, especially of uh, intergroup uh, relations. The other thing that was really interesting uh, was that I saw in some cases, in some of these events, uh, the, in, uh, people were very, people successfully uh, overcome uh, resistance. Uh, they, they solve this problem. Whereas in others, uh, this resistance behavior becomes a very pervasive one, uh, a systematic, pervasive, and a structural one. It actually persists throughout the peace process. And I'll open this up a little bit um, soon. Um, okay, let me, let me talk a little bit about how I define inclusion first. Uh, and I, I built on, first of all, um, there are two types of inclusivity, you might all know, but uh, this definition comes from Veronique Dudu's uh, work at, at Berkhoff Center. Uh, and these two types of inclusivity uh, relies on uh, our understanding of procedural and distributive justice. Again, two concepts that we see very often in social psychology. Process inclusivity refers to the extent to which negotiation and decision-making processes include excluded, relevant, and marginalized voices. Whereas outcome inclusivity 
refers to the distributive outcomes from a peace process. And it's assessed by the degree of representativeness of state institutions vis-a-vis -vis citizens uh, and the distribution of rights and entitlements across societal uh, groups. And, and I'm interested in, in uh, resistance to either the process of um, inclusion or uh, resistance to the outcome uh, the the, uh, the inclusion, the implementation of inclusion agenda, and you will actually see the model uh, in a, in a little bit, which reflects uh, considerations of both of these types of inclusivity. Okay, so if you uh, when you look at the um, the literature existing on inclusive peace processes, uh, you see that uh, they most of the, uh, they they usually fall under two categories. There is a huge literature uh, that talks about inclusion uh, as a norm, right? So we can talk about an inclusive peace process as a norm, uh, mostly based on normative frameworks that we are all most of us are familiar with, right? The UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, uh, uh, 2250 on youth, uh, other normative frameworks that developed recently in regional organizations, etc. But all of these normative frameworks um, talk about what should be, right? And and it, the focus is on the process of participation. Now, of course, this literature is ve this literature is very useful, but I thought it, it, it is not so um, adequate to understand why resistance is taking place. Uh, the second sort of um, type of literature that you see treats inclusive peace processes as an effective negotiation strategy to maximize gains in a peace process, in other words. So this, uh, this literature, as you may all be familiar, focuses on uh, inclusion as, as a way of creating legitimacy, as a, as a way of creating pu uh, increasing public buy-in, uh, and hence uh, actually uh, making uh, the implementation of a peace agreement more likely, uh, so on and so forth. But this also literature also focuses a lot on the process of participation, the process of inclusion. Now, I try to develop, and you, you, you can read more on this in the report, I try to develop a third approach here, which uh, Julie also Julie mentioned, which I call as inclusive peace process as a fundamental human need. In this, I, I try to focus on what participation means for people, for groups, and, and as I said, focusing on both process and outcome uh, in, inclusivity. So, what do I mean by inclusion as a fundamental human need? Uh, this is how I, how I define it, and I'm going to uh, elaborate a little bit more on why I define inclusion as such in a minute. Uh, so the inclusion as a fundamental human need is the degree to which a disadvantaged, or in social psychology, we call them subordinate, right, group perceives they are an esteemed and equally respected member of the society through experiencing treatment that satisfies their need for belongingness and distinctiveness at the same time. Now, the key here is um, feeling an, ex an esteemed and equally respected member of the society uh, together with other dominant groups. And the other key here is the satisfaction of these two fundamental needs at the same time, the need for belongingness and need for distinctiveness. Now, this definition relies on um, a, a, a very important uh, line of research uh, that developed in social psychology, mostly by uh, psychologist Marlon Brewer, called the optimal distinctiveness uh, theory. This theory basically suggests uh, that um, there are there are two fundamental needs uh, that motivate us, and uh, this is uh, one of them is the need for belongingness or need for inclusion, and the other one is the need for uniqueness or the or the need for distinctiveness. So individuals uh, they they feel the need to socially identify with the group. Uh, that is our need for uh, belongingness when it allows uh, an. Uh, sort of 
and this allows uh, for their satisfaction of needs for belongingness. But they also try, constantly try to seek a balance between these two needs. So there is a pull and push factor, in other words, between these two needs. And they're usually in two different, in, in two opposite uh, directions. So we, we constantly try to uh, seek a balance between validation and inclusion by uh, the group and also and similarity versus uniqueness and and and, and individual individuation and and actually um showing our distinct characteristics or distinct uh futures at the same time so the the, the tension um marlin brewer suggests that uh, the tension between these two fundamental human needs uh, finds uh, an equilibrium point and that equilibrium point is inclusion so here's here is the equilibrium point and inclusion is the only option that strikes this balance the a psychological balance between these two fundamental human needs so an inclusion then can be defined as a situation where uh where the group feels high belongingness belonging to the belonging to the society as the esteemed and equal member right uh, but also, so you're treated as an insider, like others, exactly like others, equal like others. Uh, but you're also allowed to retain your unique values and identity within that group. So it also meets the need for high distinctiveness or high, high uniqueness, the other need. And all other actually alternatives like exclusion or assimilation or differentiation are suboptimal they're not equilibrium. So, in the, so, so they are not uh, likely to be sustained, in other words. People will try to uh, change these uh, situations. They will be motivated to change these situations towards inclusion all the time. I give some examples uh, from uh, how these concepts can be uh, applied to peace processes in the report. Uh, I don't know how much time I have to go into the details of it, but here is just a very short example, for instance. So under the disguise of including women in peace negotiations, for instance, often what is being done is differentiation rather than inclusion. And here is an example. Uh, so for many years, uh, in, in Cyprus negotiations, for example, women wanted to be uh, included in the peace processes, in the negotiations. And um, for many years, negotiations were very exclude, exclusive of women in Cyprus. Even, and, and until recently, um, in 2015, um, a, a gender advisory team was established and the negotiation, negotiators and the, and the UN, the mediator, uh, sort of uh, pushed for this and the parties agreed to establish this gender advisory team, which was a women's group uh, with members from both Turkish and Greek communities, etc. This was established in 2015. Now, the, the, the committee, however, was limited to dealing with issues concerning gender equality only. And so they were isolated. They were sort of isolated from the rest of the negotiations. And uh, they were, or uh, even, I mean, the Cypriot leadership even uh, announced that uh, they were pleased to convey that in the margins of the bicommunal negotiations, to reaching a settlement on the Cyprus problem, a technical committee on gender equality has been established. So even the negotiators, they define this as if they, I mean, they are thinking that they're, be, they're including women, but even their definition of inclusion sort of indicates this uh, sort of differentiation, saying that uh, in the margins of bicommunal negotiations. So that's an example, that's not an example of inclusion, uh, but it is more an example of differentiation, for example, which says, okay, we recognize women with their distinct, unique characteristics. They're accepted, but you're not going to be seen as an insider. You're going to be in the margins of the bicommunal negotiations. So a lot of these things that are done 
in the name of inclusion are in fact not inclusion when you look at it from a fundamental uh, inclusion as a fundamental human need perspective. And I find, uh, I find this perspective uh, really useful in terms of understanding resistance as well, why we see so much uh, resistance to inclusion uh, attempts. Okay, so, uh, so you probably now have an idea how I'm actually explaining why resistance is so uh, common. Uh, one thing that is going on is that groups that are in a disadvantaged uh, position or subordinate position in the social hierarchy, they have fewer opportunities to belong to these valued or dominant groups in society. And so these group-based social hierarchies and asymmetry is very common, especially in conflict societies, conflict situations. And in fact, oftentimes what you see is that these, um, the dominant group or the privileged dominant group receives most of the positive social and political value. This could be resources, political power, social status, etc. And the subordinate group receives mostly the negative social value. And on top of this, it's very difficult to change this situation because of what we call in the what we call as the hierarchy enhancing forces, which constantly produce and maintain uh, discourses, narratives uh, to legitimize this high uh, group based social inequality in the society. Uh, and if these hierarchy enhancing forces are more dominant, more powerful, and, and uh, more in the game, in other words, as opposed to or compared to hierarchy attenuating forces in a society, we often see this imbalance, exclusion of the subordinate group, etc., and uh, conflict. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of this theory for the sake of time, but I would be happy to answer some of the, um, you know, some of the research behind this as well. Uh, but this is uh, just, let me just say this, this kind of dynamic uh, can uh, reveal itself in individual attitudes and behavior, in the individual acts of uh, people that show domination uh, and, uh, and discrimination against the subordinate group member. But, they but it can also reveal itself in uh, in the form of institutional discrimination, in, in the rules, procedures, actions uh, of institutions uh, that maintain uh, this group hierarchy in a society. So you can observe it in the individual's behavior, but you can also observe it in institutional behavior. Um, and as I said, they tend to persist because of these legitimizing myths, uh, narratives that uh, shape uh, people's attitudes, values, stereotypes in a, in a society that provide justification to this to hierarchy between the dominant and subordinate uh, groups. And in the report, I give a lot of examples to this, uh, mostly from Nepal, for example, how this um, sort of uh, historical ideological narratives favoring uh, several of the uh, castes uh, known as Has Arya uh, has been used as a legitimizing myth to exclude these subordinate groups in the society. And when the peace process started, peace negotiations started, it was the, for the first time these subordinate groups were included in hundreds of years of exclusion, perhaps. And that tipped the balance, that tipped the balance in, in the in the society and, and it constituted a, a, a threat to, and it was perceived as a threat by these privileged dominant group uh, members. And this is actually one key motivation in uh, resistance uh, to inclusion uh, behavior. There's also some interesting, um, uh, there's also some interesting research, recent research from neuroscience and uh, cognitive psychology which establishes a link between, um, uh, talks about the consequences of social exclusion, and it establishes a link between why, uh, you know, um, exclusion uh, and, and these inclusive processes are so related and, and with conflict and, and also um, how, how it works. 
For example, some uh, recent neuroscience research uh, suggests that exclusion, social exclusion overlaps in our brains uh, with physical pain, equal as physical pain. So um, anger, disappointment, sadness are common consequences of social exclusion. Um, Another, uh, a, another important study, several studies actually, they suggest that exclusion um, leads to emotions like anger, disappointment, sadness, and it, and it also results in loss of social support, decreased access to resources, and eventually diminished group self-esteem. Uh, this leads to reduced group self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is a concept in psychology that talks about uh, sort of how uh, capable the group or the individual see sees itself, how confident they are in overcoming difficulties, right? Uh, so reduced self-efficacy in turn undermines the perception um, uh, of control. So it eventually results in a groups or individuals uh, loss of control or perception of losing control. Uh, what happens when you perceive that you have lost control? Think about from your own lives, right? When, when that is the feeling like right now in a pandemic, you know, we often experience this. It triggers a lot of anxiety. It, it may trigger a lot of frustration, anger, uh, and very rarely it triggers positive uh, emotions, positive feelings. Most of the time it's negative. Okay, I like this uh, quote from Kurt Levine, uh, a social psychologist. If you want tr truly to understand something, try to change it. And that's exactly what happens when we start, when a peace process starts or a negotiation process starts. It sort of uh, tries changing some of these established uh, sort of ways in a society. And uh, we see a lot of uh, reactions to it. Okay, so uh, let me uh, briefly also talk about uh, the, what, what the findings were from the, these 85 incidences of resistance, as I mentioned. So first of all, I define, um, I, I identified two types of uh, resistance. Uh, in, um, in this um, project. So the first one, I call it targeted or limited resistance. This usually takes place either against the participation, participation of a particular group or some, or individuals, uh, such as uh, people from diaspora, women, or some representatives of civil society, etc. So either it's targeted uh, towards a particular uh, group or people, or it is limited with a particular time uh, period during the negotiation and peace process. I give an example of this in the report from the Intertagic Dialogue. Um, so uh, in, 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 this, um, in this case, you know, while negotiating the end of the civil war in Tajikistan between 1993 and 1997, initially the UN mediators asked the Tajik government to include some civil society uh, representatives. And the government rejected it, saying that, no, the civil society, we, we, we don't need them, we don't want them, they're too cozy with the opposition. So they rejected. However, later on, um, as, as, as the government found ideas from some of the civil society very useful for the negotiation process, especially uh, coming from this high level uh, dialogue effort uh, called the Intertagic Dialogue, uh, which was actually facilitated by, by late Hal Sanders, they changed their mind and they thought their contributions can be really useful. It's not that they're, they're really co-opted by uh, the opposition, but they have independent views and ideas, etc. So they decided to include them. So here's an example to a more targeted, limited resistance, which was overcome. Uh, on the other hand, pervasive resistance is systematic. It, it is often, uh, we see that it's often by the same societal or political actor throughout the peace process, and it persists, uh, it persists through different stages of the peace process. And oftentimes the aim is to curb the inclusion agenda altogether, and even sometimes to curb the peace process altogether. 
And oftentimes we also see a lot of references to these hierarchy enhancing, legitimizing myths. Uh, and an example of this could be uh, the Guatemala uh, peace negotiations, uh, where we see the resistance of the same uh, economic elite to, to the inclusion um, agenda, especially uh, related to socioeconomic reforms, because they saw this as threatening their privileged status uh, in the society. And we see that they are attempting to basically to disrupt the process, they keep trying from the beginning, uh, from the uh, negotiation to the implementation. And eventually they become more successful in the implementation phase, uh, especially in the referendum where they, uh, the, the, the referendum fails to uh, ratify uh, socioeconomic reforms, especially around land. Okay, so uh, here is, a, remember I said in both inclusivity in terms of resistance in, ter in terms of process and resistance to the outcome. So we see that oftentimes in these pervasive types of resistance, these are combined. Uh, so here on the left hand side, you see um, the, um, uh, the objective of inclusion. Uh, so it could be the inclusive negotiation practice inclusive peace process, but eventually the goal of inclusion is to reach uh, transformative inclusion, right, is to reach an inclusive society. And uh, this goes uh, sort of in a, in, a, in a parallel way to the negotiation, uh, you know, an you can talk about an negoti inclusive negotiation process, then you can talk about inclusive codification, where some of this uh, inclusion ideas are codified in a peace agreement and then in, in and then implementation so that is how uh, it leads to an inclusive society and um, the type of resistance is you see uh, limited resistance uh, takes place uh, at one of these stages or more limited whereas pervasive resistance is all uh, throughout uh, during the negotiation phase, during the codification phase, and during the materialization. All right, after uh, coding these 85 incidences, uh, so as I said, one of the things that I looked at was um, the, uh, the, the tactics used. Uh, what, uh, what kind of tactics uh, do people use to uh, block participation of others? Uh, and I, I divided, the, uh, what I found, I, I divided them into three categories. The first category, I call it implus, implicit elusive tactics. Um, and these are, uh, I'll explain them in a minute, uh, what I mean by this. The second one is what I call this explicit direct uh, tactics. Uh, the first one, implicit elusive, is mostly what we call as, is, is a result of unconscious bias or implicit bias and they're more like automatic responses people are often not aware of uh, of these biases and people are not often often aware of the fact that uh, they are uh, preventing someone's inclusion in the process whereas in the explicit direct uh, this is intentional they know they do this on purpose um, to uh, prevent uh, groups or some people's inclusion in the process. Uh, but different from the last category, which is coercive, uh, explicit direct tactics are more like um, subtle or more disguised, they're more manipulative. They, they try to manipulate the decision-making process, the selection procedures, implementation. So they're more subtle, they're more disguised. Uh, and in fact, on paper, it may look like inclusion, but in fact, the resistance is going on behind the, the curtains in a way. Uh, in, the coercive, uh, uh, in the coercive set, we see actually use of violence or the threat of use of violence against uh, some people uh, to prevent their uh, participation. So these tactics uh, are basically categorized based on these two uh, criteria, how intense and severe, uh, severely they used by resisting actors. So of course, coercive tactics are much more severe and intense than implicit. And whether there is any uh, sort of uh, social or, or identity-based or institutionalized basis of resistance. 
Okay, so let me go over them uh, quickly and perhaps give a few examples. So implicit resistance is, as I said, are more like unconscious acts of resistance due to automatic reactions, due to Im uh, implicit bias. Uh, and uh, and a, a certain cues in the situation can automatically activate these biases. Uh, so they're not necessarily intentional, but they are habitual. They can be activated through any kind of cues. For example, a simple cue could be you, you immediately think of uh, men, mediators, when uh, somebody talks about picking a special envoy. For for uh, for a mediation, okay. That even that that word, the the situation, especially in envoy, could be automatically activating that this will be a man, okay. Uh, and people do not necessarily think about these things, but they're they're a result of our um, uh, socialization. So gender related cues uh, are very very common, um, and what is what is really difficult with implicit uh, resistance is that it's very hard to detect uh, and act upon it and it requires a lot of high awareness because oftentimes people who are falling into this bias are not necessarily aware of it and then if you ask their explicit opinions about for example what they think about women inclusion in uh, in a peace process they will they say they will support it but in fact their behavior does not necessarily align with that and I give some examples from these interviews with women negotiators uh, in the report. You can read more. Uh, I am not going into it for the sake of time to see how implicit bias works and how, how it can actually prevent inclusion. The second type, um, as I said, is direct explicit. These are intentional, as I said, intentional use of contentious tactics but usually in a very manipulative manner and, under the and often under the disguise of inclusion. And in fact, these kinds of tactics damage the inclusion practice and inclusion agenda uh, even really, I mean, um, really badly. And, and, and it, it actually also uh, disappoints uh, masses. So, so it, it is really, this is something that we really need to be thinking about seriously. Uh, because especially following the do no harm uh, principle. And most of the time, uh, the, the, it, these tactics occur through manipulating or fully hijacking decision-making processes. I uh, categorize these tactics under uh, five, uh, five, six uh, types, which was inspired a lot from this famous anthropologist, James Scott's work on everyday uh, resistance. Uh, but he studies peasants and how they resist the, uh, the authoritarian uh, sort of uh, government in subtle uh, ways during their everyday life. Uh, I use it in a completely different context here, but um, the, I, I found the categories very useful. Uh, so the first one is sabotage. Uh, so by sabotage, basically what I mean is uh, blocking the access of people uh, to an inclusive process and or blocking the access of people in the process to sensitive information. Um, this could be the old, uh, some powerful elite, for example, in Nepal, hijacking the process. This is what they did in the constitution uh, making process after, uh, after the peace agreement was signed. Again, you can actually refer to the report to read the details of how it happened. Basically, even though it looks like it's an inclusive process, like the constitution making process, there was a deadlock and the, they, the deadlock uh, prevented them from reaching a constitutional draft. And eventually this elite took over the decision making process behind the closed doors, excluded others, uh, and they came up with their own proposal unilaterally. Another example uh, is from the RC that I use, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the inter-Congolese uh, negotiations, where the leader, Laurent Kabila, uh, put very minor obstacles. They look like very minor obstacles, but they can block uh, complete access. Uh, they can, they, it blocked uh, the access of civil society to negotiations, actually. So even though on paper he accepted that civil society can participate, uh, he didn't issue travel documents, for example, for people to travel to the uh, 
negotiation location, and it was uh, simply blocking their access. Another category, another behavioral tactic that we see uh, as, as part of this is what I call as false compliance. False compliance, again, looks like inclusion on the paper, but uh, it is actually a type of inclusion where the power holders, again, most of the time, uh, or uh, try to control who will be in the inclusive process. And they support inclusion as long as it abides by the boundaries drawn by this elite. Uh, some recent examples of this kind of behavior is for the national dialogue attempted in Egypt, for example, uh, after uh, the transition from Mubarak. The other two tactics uh, here, I call one of them as securitization of inclusion, uh, as something that is imposed by uh, outside powers, as a security threat to the society, etc. And I, um, again, I give examples from uh, Nepal here. Uh, and, of, and finally, slander, ridicule, humiliation, verbal ridiculing, verbal humilia humi humiliation. A lot of women experience this in negotiations. Uh, I also give examples from the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition. Okay, who are the targets of resistance? Mostly 26% of the incidences, it was civil society. Uh, they, people did not want, want participation of civil society. About 10% women. Uh, par against participation of ethnic religious groups, they had representatives, 13%. Uh, but see, the, the, the biggest category here is the inclusive approach. Uh, so not, there is not a specific group of, or people, but the target is uh, to prevent that inclusive process to take place, whatever it is. It could be a national dialogue process, it could be uh, a commission, it could be consultations, uh, etc. But it is against, it's trying to prevent that inclusive uh, process to take place. Who resists? Now, I, I, I think this is not going to surprise you if I say that 56% of the cases, resistance comes from uh, power holder elites. That is government, different government entities, local or national level, political leaders and military elite, military leaders combined. Other than that, about 13% of the cases, we see resistance from armed group members, rebel group members. Uh, about 11% of the cases, uh, opposition or uh, political parties, other political parties, not the negotiating gover governing parties. And about 20% of the cases, uh, resistance comes from these uh, broad ethnic religious uh, groups in the society. The um, opposition political parties or movements, uh, their resistance to inclusion uh, usually represents a broad societal based uh, or strong nationalistic constituency most of the time. Uh, examples of this are, for example, the Sinhalese nationalist groups in Sri Lanka, uh, in, in the case of Turkey's Kurdish peace process, the MHB and their constituency, the, the hyper-nationalist party, uh, the Kyrgyz Nationalist Party against the Uzbeks inclusion in Kyrgyzstan, um, in Macedonia, again, the uh, nationalists, uh, nationalist groups against the implementation participation of Albanians in the process, etc. Armed group resistance it, it tends to be more targeted, more limited. Uh, and usually armed groups resist the participation of other armed groups in negotiations. Um, and uh, they, they feel threatened by that. All right, so let me also go very quickly over the motivations of re resistance. I already talked about this, so I'll, I'll be quick. So we can summarize uh, what motivates resistance into three. And even though these are all connected, they, they are conceptually different too. And I think it's important to recognize that. Uh, so a lot of times uh, it is due to com political competition and reluctance to share power. So the, the situation I described in the DRC, Laura Kabila's prevention of uh, civil society from participating is a good example of this. In other cases, like in Guatemala, the dominant group, the privileged group, fears loss of economic privileges, and so they resist. So there could be an economic threat too. And sometimes actually it is what I call as the social identity threat. The dominant group status 
the social status being this group that is sort of used to enjoying these uh, dominant status, privileged status in the society at the top of the social hierarchy are threatened. And this is more like an ontological existential kind of threat. They are threatened and they react to losing uh, their privileged group status. And uh, the, what goes on in Nepal is, is a good example uh, of this. And in, and in fact, uh, you see that the, the socially dominant groups are also, they also overlap in some cases with the economically dominant and the politically dominant groups in the society too. So you see all of these sort of uh, threats uh, at the same time. All right, so the, the, the last thing that I try to do in this report is also to talk about some of the strategies to overcome resistance. At the moment, I'm actually doing a little bit more research on this because the previous research was mostly based on identifying uh, the actors, uh, types, etc. So I'm, I'm, I'm more focusing on these uh, strategies to overcome resistance. So here is a couple of uh, concluding uh, remarks in that sense. Uh, so I suggest that we need to adopt a nuanced, nuanced approach. Uh, so we can't treat all types of resistance in the same uh, manner. And we also need a nuanced approach because there are some things that can be done immediately in the short term, and there are other things that can be done or that should be done in the, in the long term. So for example, long-term ideological change, long-term cultural change is necessary in order to deal with these legitimizing myths, the hierarchy and enhancing sort of legitimizing myths, for example, but it, is, it cannot be done immediately in a peace process. It's a long-term uh, process. In the short term, on the other hand, there are things that can be done. Uh, for example, in, introducing some institutional incentives in the, into the peace process, into the negotiation process, so that these, uh, it's not so easy for these power holder elites to hijack or to, to manipulate these processes, for instance. Um, so I build on some of these ideas and, and, and some, some um, examples to this could be whether that inclusive process has a non-binding mandate or a binding mandate makes a lot of difference, for example. So can we, how, what can we do in the process design? What kind of decision-making uh, rules, procedures we can introduce to the process so that it becomes more difficult for these power ho holder elites to take over and to manipulate these processes uh, and, and, uh, and exclude the, or, or prevent the inclusion agenda from taking place. So these decision-making procedures are, and rules are very important in that sense, I found in the, uh, in the research. Uh, deadlocks, for example, if the decision-making pr processes are uh, likely to create deadlocks, these deadlocks are often used by the power holder elites to take over the process or to manipulate the process. So what can we do? How can we design these decision-making processes to avoid deadlocks, for instance? So this is something that can be done in the process design and in the short run. I also suggest some ideas into, uh, with regards to introducing compliance measures, uh, compliance with inclusion indicators uh, that are set in the beginning of the process. And there could even be a, a, an, um, an ombuds person uh, that can help with uh, the compliance with these inclusion indicators. And I also uh, discuss what can be done at three different levels, as I said, individual level, micro, dealing with the micro level, attitudes, bias, individual behavior, uh, group institutional level, um, and uh, the, the kinds of things that you, get, that you can do in a systemic, ideological, more macro level, like um, nonviolent action, advocacy, education, ideological change, cultural change, etc. And finally, um, here are some of the ideas that I discuss in the report as to what can be done to overcome uh, resistance. So uh, that's it. I'm going to end it here. Thank you so much, Esther. That was really informative and also moved us, um, our little team in here, to already think more and reflect more and discuss a little bit while we were listening to you.
looking at your presentation. But I want to thank all of you for joining us um, and I want to say goodbye to those people who will join us in the future on YouTube. <laughs>